Hey, good evening everyone. I uh, hope to have you here tonight. Glad to have you here with us uh, while we made a last minute change. It's actually morning for me. It's uh, mid-morning, Saturday morning as I'm recording this. We're releasing it at our normal worship time. Um, thanks for tuning in tonight. You know, we had to make a quick change. COVID hit our household and just not sure where, uh, what that would look like with the rest of us and everything. Um, we just had to make a quick change. So we didn't have time to, to make a change um, other than just go online. So thanks for being patient with us tonight. Um, we will be back physically in worship next week together. And uh, Mac Groom will be leading us through a message next week. So at any rate, we're going to finish the Apostles' Creed tonight. Um, we started this several weeks ago, and we've kind of gone phrase by phrase uh, through the Apostles' Creed. And so there's tonight, there's just a few phrases left that we're going to cover. And just as a reminder where we've been, it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So that's the Apostles' Creed. That's this creed that the church has recited to each other. Recite it, we recite it to ourselves. We declare our beliefs. We declare our distinctly Christian beliefs, our Trinitarian beliefs, as you see, where it covers the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in this last part that we're going to look at tonight, it's a transition of sorts because it's focused on each of us. It says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the life everlasting. Amen. And so four words we're looking at. Forgiveness, resurrection, life, and amen. Forgiveness, resurrection, life and amen. And I want us to see together the beauty of the gospel that's reflected in those four words. And the first one that we're looking at tonight is forgiveness. And as we declare our belief in the forgiveness of sins, it really starts with the need to understand that we are in fact sinners. And can I just tell you like this truth is wildly offensive. It's been offensive for thousands of years and it will continue to offend. Because the moment we say that we are sinners means that there is a moral judge over everything. That it's not just what feels good, do it. It's there are standards. God has created all things. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That God is creator. We are created. And we just understand the truth as he has revealed it. That he does sit and judge. That he will judge all of us. The moment we talk about the forgiveness of sins, we have to start with the truth that we are sinners. And you know, chances are, if you ask a neighbor or a coworker if, if they're a good guy or a good person or a good lady or whatever, almost everyone's going to say that they are. And they'll be like, ah, you know, I haven't killed anybody or robbed the bank. I haven't cheated on my wife yet. So I must be, you know, I'm better than that guy. Like, we love... The comparison games. I love, like, my sinful heart loves the comparison games. As long as I'm comparing to myself to someone I think I'm better than. Like, we love the comparison games. And where most of us, we, we kind of go, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, whoever that guy is. We will always be able to find someone somewhere that's going to make us feel better about ourselves, At least for a little while. But hear me, like, there is no rest in the comparison game. Because while we'll always be able to find someone that's, that we think we're better than, there will always be someone looking at us that says they're better than us. Unless you're like Michael Jordan or Steph Curry. Uh, Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time, regardless of what happens in the playoffs this season. Regardless of what uh, the guy out in Los Angeles, LeBron James, does, Michael Jordan will always be the greatest basketball player of all time, just so you know. 
But there's, there's always going to be someone that we can look at and find, find ourselves comparing favorably to. And there's always going to be someone that can look at us and compare favorably to us. And because of that, there's no rest in this comparison game. It's like the hamster wheel. It just spins and spins and spins and spins and spins. We're always looking to find the next person to compare ourselves to so we can feel better about ourselves and whether we're talking about how we do at school, how we do in sports, how we do in music, how we do in work, how we do in church even, or the moral choices we make. There's always going to be someone that we're looking to compare ourselves to. But when we stand with each other and say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, what we're saying is that we are in fact sinful, we inherited the sin and guilt of Adam, and that we're even more sinful than anyone even knows other than the Lord himself. We're more sinful than anyone even knows other than the Lord. And our offense isn't just against another person, it's primarily against God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And there's this incredible picture in the scriptures, specifically in the Psalms, of, of the depth of our sin. In the Psalms, we get this incredible picture, Psalm chapter 51. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. And the caption in my English Bible is a prayer for restoration. Now, you probably know the story about David. How David, there was this, the scriptures say there was a time of year when kings were at war with their troops. But David stayed home. And when he was home, he's bouncing around the roof. You know, he sent all of his guys to fight for him. And he stayed back at the palace. And he goes for this stroll on the roof. And he sees this lady bathing. He tells his servants, go get her. I want her. Well, she's married. But David doesn't care. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, tries to cover it up by bringing her husband home. Eventually, David's uh, cover-up would get to the point where he puts the husband of this woman that he saw and decided he wanted, he gets the husband and puts him on the front lines and tells his troop to pull back to make sure that the brother would die. Like he wanted to make certain that the guy would die. And David would eventually be confronted with his sin by Nathan the prophet. And in response to that, the Holy Spirit leads David to a prayer of repentance that's been, been included in the Bible. It's in Psalm chapter 51. It says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love and according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before you. And hear this part. In verse 4, he says, Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, David sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against the nation of Israel that he was called to lead, that he was ordained by God to lead. He sinned against Uriah, her husband. He sinned against a lot of people, but ultimately his violation is against the law of God. And he sees that. He says, against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach wisdom. Teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than s snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. David was guilty. And he's begging the Lord in this prayer of repentance to blot out, to cleanse him from all of his guilt. He says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. Hear that. Like the Lord is concerned with the posture of our hearts before him as we see our sin for what it is, a violation of God, a violation against God, ultimately against God alone. Like he's not saying, he doesn't, he doesn't care about what my neighbor does or my coworker does. I mean, he does, but when he's dealing with me, it's not, well, well, 
Lord, I'm not as bad as this guy. I certainly I'm better than that guy or that gal. Or, you know, I don't drive too fast in the neighborhood at least. And, you know, I haven't cheated on my taxes. And I, I, I give an honest report at work and all of these things. Like, he's not concerned with that because he's concerned with the posture of my heart. And when we stand and declare that we believe in the forgiveness of sins, that's when we say, Lord, I need a new heart. Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We declare that we are trusting in his forgiveness. We are trusting in Christ's uh, sacrifice for us, his once for all time sacrifice for us. We're trusting that when we run to him in repentance, he restores us completely. He says, in your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in, your, in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. See, the comparison game leads to the hamster wheel. We're always spinning, we're always running, we're always looking for someone to compare ourselves to, to make ourselves feel better, to make ourselves feel less guilty. God calls us to a posture of repentance where we own our sin, where we say, Lord, against you, you alone have I sinned. Forgive me. I trust in Jesus, forgive me. And to say that we are in fact sinful means that there is an absolute standard by which all people everywhere are evaluated. And I'm going to tell you this like as kindly as I can, as graciously as I can, that God's standards do not change with our cultural moment. Hear that one more time. God's standards do not change with our cultural moment. There's a lot of crazy things happening in America specifically. Lots of crazy stuff. But hear me. God's standards do not change with our cultural moment. God's standards are unchanging and we cannot downplay sin and our need for forgiveness. We cannot downplay sin in our neighbors, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our, our classmates needs for forgiveness because we need to own our sin and run to the cross experiencing the forgiveness that Jesus alone offers. In 1 John chapter 1, there's this powerful Powerful two verses, and we focus in on verse 9, but I want us to look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 as well. So if you have a Bible, you can flip over. It's almost to the end as you're flipping pages to your right. It says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin. You know, you know who says we have no sin? People that play the comparison game. We, if we say we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. We're only fooling ourselves. We're not fooling anyone else. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, hear this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you have your Bible open, circle, underline, highlight that word all. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So that's the beautiful thing about what I, what I was talking about where there's rest in repentance. Like the comparison game is going to make you tired and grumpy. But when we repent... When we run to the cross, we find rest and we can stand with those who stand with us and say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. We turn from our sin and we trust in Jesus alone to forgive us and he will, he absolutely will. The next phrase in the creed uh, we're not going to spend a ton of time in. Um, I wanted to spend most of our time tonight in the phrase, the forgiveness of sins, and I'm going to try to keep it appropriate because I know if you're watching this, you're watching this digitally. But the next phrase is the resurrection 
of the body. And for the sake of time, we're not going to deal a ton here. Uh, if we had been meeting in person, we'd have more time. But the key scripture is, is really all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the priority of the resurrection. But for, night, for tonight, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verses 50 and 50 through 52. It says, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we will be changed. Jesus is going to come back and he is going to raise us to life and we will get a resurrection body. There's lots of scripture that talk about the believers to be resurrected to life. We will be raised and we will live forever with him. The resurrection of the body is going to happen. Now some people would say, oh well that means we, we can't be cremated or oh well that means this and that means that and I'm just going to tell you this like we're not going to, I'm not going to say more than what scripture says but hear me like god spoke and created everything around us he can resurrect he can resurrect us from cremation i I believe that to be inside his power um we will be raised with god to live forever with jesus and that brings us to the very next phrase jesus is going to bring us home he says in the life everlasting i believe in the forgiveness of sins I believe the resurrection of the body, and I believe in the life everlasting. I, and we look at the end of the book of Revelation. This is what John sees this vision, and he's told by the Lord to write it down. He says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. The presence of God forever and ever and ever. Like you hear people say, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to play golf all day. No, you're not. Like, If you're looking at something earthly to represent heaven, you have not studied the scriptures. Because our forever life with God, when we've breathed our last breath, God raises us from the dead, resurrects our body, we are united with Christ forever and ever and ever. It's going to be nothing like what we have here. This is a new heaven and a new earth. God's dwelling is with us. He will live with us us. And for the Christian, this is the promise of hope, that certainty that Jesus will bring us home and we will be with him forever. The creed ends with one word. It's our final word for tonight. It's a word of affirmation. It's amen. We look at this creed, the whole thing. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When we say amen, we're saying, yes, I believe this. I have hitched my entire life to these truths. Because remember, the word believe is not like some of us, I believe this is going to happen, I believe this is going to happen. It's like there's certainty. And there's this life-altering commitment behind the word believe as the Bible uses it, as the creed uses it. Do you believe these things? Are you willing to stand and say, yes, I believe. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness to us. Lord, I pray over our time tonight. I thank you for the gift of technology that allows us to meet remotely tonight. 
And Father, I pray as uh, our church presses forward, Lord, I pray that you would give us the grace and the courage to stand and declare our beliefs. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you back in person next week.